Hi, everybody. My name is Beth Weinstein. I direct events for the New York Times. I am so excited that you're here. Can I, can I see how many of you are subscribers? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to you. We programmed this event with you in mind, and we are here because of you, so thank you. Um, tonight's event is just one of the many that we will be bringing to LA in the coming weeks and months. We plan to be here once a month from here on out, so, uh, so we hope to keep seeing you around. Our programming strives to provide a window into the newsroom and the stories behind the stories. We want to facilitate a conversation between you and our journalists who are at the center of today's most important stories. And I can't imagine a better event to start with than with an event with The Daily. They ushered us into a new moment of storytelling and connecting you with our journalists. Tonight you'll hear from Michael Barbaro, who, <laughs> that's right, who had formerly been our national political reporter. He covered two presidential campaigns. He covered City Hall and also the US retail industry. I'd just like to say, let's continue the conversation. Visit us online at timesevents.nytimes.com. Um, head out to the um, information desk afterwards and sign up for our event newsletters. And enjoy the show and don't forget your totes. Thank you. Thank you for that, and hello, LA. We... This is the Daily's first time on the West Coast. This is, frankly, the Daily's first time out of the New York Times building. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've been released. Um, all we do is make the Daily. We get up in the morning, we go into the office, we leave in the wee hours in the morning, we make the Daily. And so, it took us two years to get to the point where we could come out to the West Coast and, and see you guys. And we are so thrilled to be here because, first of all, we're out of the building. Um, we're breathing air. I mean, even your air. <laughs> and uh, pull it to, that's an environmental joke, not, not yeah. And, um, and when we got out of the car yesterday and showed up in front of this theater, this incredible theater, um, it was beyond words to see the daily in this bright light marquee for the first time. It was like just incredible. Um, it was incredible. <laughs> it was interesting. It was like a creative play on, on your name. Yeah. I think it we was. have a picture actually was, of the like marquee. A, like an interesting it way was, of introducing it. Was an, it was, at first it was a thrill and then it was a spelling error. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> It's but so still close. so great. It's so and close. I think <laughs> still great. So close. <laughs> so close. How did you pronounce it? I think it's Barbao. Barbao. Like a And I have bun. to say, yeah. I have to say that the wonderful people here fixed it. Portuguese. They fixed it immediately. Um, I, but I think it's a reminder that we are a really young show. We are. I'm, an, I'm a new host. You're not really a celebrity. Yeah. No, I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of room to grow, a lot of recognition to to create, mm -hmm. and that is why we are so grateful, especially Michael Barbow, um, <laughs> that you came out tonight. We are a new show, we are a young show, and we want to thank you guys for coming out, supporting us. <laughs> and with me on stage are two of my favorite people in the world, Annie Brown and Caitlin Dickerson. And you guys have gotten to know Caitlin, first as a fantastic guest, and then as a fantastic guest host. I actually wish you would guest host more. <laughs> I would love to guest host more. You would? Talk to my boss. Okay. <laughs> I'm um, there. And in your day job, you are a national immigration reporter for the Times. Yeah, it's been a little busy. It's been a, it's been a bit... <laughs> <laughs> Could be tough. It's been, a, it's been a couple of months. It's been a couple of years. Yeah. Um, Annie Brown, to my far right. 
Um, you have not heard her as much on the show as you've heard Caitlin, and that is because Annie is right off the mic making the show. Although you actually have heard her a few times in the last week. Annie made two of the most remarkable episodes I can remember just in the last seven days. The first were, was a two-part episode called Lost to the Storm. It was the story of... <laughs> yes. It was a story of Wayne Daly and his wife Casey, and it was heartbreaking. And we cried making it, we cried listening to it. I'm sure you did the same. And just today, Annie made another extraordinary episode, which is a conversation with the victim of a, a sexual assault in high school, Caitlin Flanagan. So you are, you are truly in the presence of audio greatness, and um, you're welcome. <laughs> So the reason I'm so excited to have you both on stage is that you two and the three of us together kind of represent the convergence of the most essential elements of the daily. You've got the dashing host, <laughs> you've got the intrepid reporter, and you've got the brilliant hidden hand of the producer. And I think what we're gonna do tonight is kind of pull back the curtain on how it is the daily is made and how stories like immigration, the greatest stories of our time, are told on this show, which as I said is only about a little less than two years old, and we're still kind of figuring out exactly who we are, and we're figuring out who you are, and how to get you into a theater. <laughs> and, um, and in a sense, Caitlin, the story of The Daily is the story of your appearances on The Daily, because you came onto the show in the first week or two of our existence, which was the winter of 2017. I That's think right. it was February. Mm -hmm. It was the first week, yeah. Yeah, I, I went and grabbed this episode um, and listened to it when we were preparing for this, and it's hysterical because the beginning of it, Michael sounds completely different than he does now. He sounds like a small child version of Michael Barbaro. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to play it for you. Um, small, we have sorry, a clip did you say of a, a small child version of Of, of Michael Barbaro, yes. Um, we should, we should, yeah, we should let's, them, let's we should let them it, hear. That clip. From the New York Times, I'm Michael Barbaro. This is The Daily. So bad. The timing is weird. Today, the 16-year-old high school student who railed against Spanish language in his California high school and grew up to become President Trump's top policy advisor so bad. on immigration. <laughs> so that, that, we thought it was good. We did. We thought it was good. That billboard, that, we call that the billboard at the beginning of the show. And we agonize over it. Apparently we didn't agonize enough. And, um, and that was about Stephen Miller. And I mean, it's te that's terrible. Um, I, that, I didn't know what I was doing. And I never really did. I mean, I, was a, I came to the Daily as a print reporter, right. as a political reporter, as a retail reporter. You were a retail reporter? Yeah, I covered shopping. <laughs> <laughs> I covered shopping. I covered the, the I've only thought of you as like political reporter Michael Barbaro. Yeah. When I started thing. covering the US retail industry, Abercrombie was still hot. Ooh. Um, wow. That was an important moment in my life. Was yes. it? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Ripped jeans? <laughs> yes. And I, uh, I came to audio, I mean, I came to audio as a completely blank slate, right. which on the one hand is good. On the other hand, I didn't know what I was doing. And that sounds so remarkably different because I, I just had no authority and I had no concept of what it meant to be a host and I think that's why I mean everything just sounds so kind of different and not fully formed in that mm -hmm. clip you sound stiff yeah you sound a little uncomfortable I was uncomfortable yeah mm -hmm. it was uncomfortable to be suddenly the host of a of a daily audio show yeah and what we would do is we'd go into the studio all day and it would be one or two in the morning and we would be doing that thing that billboard at the top of the show and we would just agonize right. over every single word, trying really to figure did. out how I was supposed to sound. Yeah. And There's this story that has become kind of mythic on the sh within the producers, um, and it's of the night before the first episode was published. And Michael just could not say the date with any, like, gravitas. <laughs> and, and so we spent, like, an hour go going over and over the date, and each producer sort of trying their hand at coaching him through it, um, and, and so, we, patient. So, so patient, so um, patient, 
And, and we have the last 15 seconds of this night, which um, I also wanted to play for you. Yeah, thanks. If we can play that clip. <laughs> it's Wednesday, February 1st. It's Wednesday, February 1st. It's, it's Wednesday, February 1st. <laughs> What's the matter? I'm not hitting Wednesday, right? I know, I just, these directions are not meaning a whole lot to me. <laughs> it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday, February 1st. There you go. That's a wrap. All right. All right, now we gotta fucking narrate. It's <laughs> April Montessori. A little touchy. <laughs> you were a little it's defensive hard. at it's the hard. beginning. Yes. Yeah. Last night, last night I told Kaylin the, 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 the um, the host of the daily does not throw tantrums, but there were nights. <laughs> amazing. There That's were there amazing. were nights I got really really upset, and I think I told you what I did. I didn't know what to do. I was so self conscious. I would I would take a small bottle of water sometimes and push it as close to the edge as possible and see if it would fall off. Um, he wasn't gonna throw it. He wasn't gonna make a scene, <laughs> but he wanted to, so he just just went like I just that. I want you to imagine. It would seem like an accident. I just want you to imagine that it's two in the morning, and for the third hour, someone's telling you that the word Wednesday is not coming out of your mouth correctly. <laughs> and that, and that they, they're like, they can't quite articulate why it's not working. And the answer is because I wasn't working. And, um, and the reality is I sounded different back then yeah. because I, my voice was different. And one of the things that happened because of producers like you, Annie, and the rest of the team is that they taught me how to lower my voice and how to become the host of The Daily. And I think it's worth pointing out why that happened. I mean, it wasn't just this kind of superficial question of, of if you're, is your voice deep enough? It was that it was February of 2017. Right. Donald Trump had just been inaugurated. A Muslim ban had been essentially announced. There was a, bit, there was a crackdown on undocumented immigration. There were, it felt like one of the most complicated, chaotic, confusing moments, it, certainly in my lifetime, and the point you all were making, and it was right, was if you don't bring enough gravity to this show, then the show won't work. And so I literally learned to lower the register of my voice, right. and that is now how I talk. And now you're quite good at it. At yeah, it's weird, date. though, because it actually became the whole way that I talk. Mm. Um, not but you just do have the, a host voice. I, yeah, I do, have a, I do have a host voice. Give us a little taste. Maybe we should have a taste. <laughs> um, you want to taste some of yes. it? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I heard it earlier. It's, it's excellent. Okay. Um, it's... <laughs> Here we go. It's Thursday. It's Thursday, September 20th. Ooh, no, deeper. Could be lower. Okay, this is producing. <laughs> um, it's Thursday, September 20th. Great. Better? Better. Okay. Great. Um, <laughs> and it is. It is Thursday, September yeah, 20th. It is. That's right. One of the dynamics I think you'll discover about The Daily, and we're not a live show, we are a heavily edited show, is producers producing. And, and it's an extraordinary thing to behold, um, because no one sounds like the way people sound on The Daily naturally, I right. don't think. I mean, they do once in a while. This is a, this is a show that's shaped by these kinds of brains, and we're gonna kind of show you that tonight. And what's interesting about voice and authority is that, Caitlin, you actually knew so much more about all this than I did at the beginning of the show because you came from public radio. NPR. <laughs> I did come from NPR, yeah, that's do, right. I just heard somebody rep NPR. Do you, do you remember Caitlin's amazing. NPR days? Somebody out there? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I came from NPR. You, it's, your, it's your fan base. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so I came from NPR and, and it was a huge relief and really exciting for me when I got to the Times because, you know, it was this really dramatic and scary moment for me that I had to walk away from audio to learn newspapers. And then shortly after I show up at the Times, they tell me, oh, we're starting an audio department. It's like, great, I get the best of both worlds. And also I get to do something that I know how to do that's going to mm -hmm. make me look good because I didn't know what I was doing with print. That's right, so you called me up in the first week. I'm like, perfect, this is gonna make me look great in front of my boss, I've done this a million times, I'm gonna be interviewed, I know exactly how this is gonna go. But as you all know, and as I quickly learned, The Daily is actually a, an entirely different beast. It was different from anything that I'd ever heard, much less anything mm -hmm. that I'd ever worked on before, and so that was really exciting. It's been great to be able to marry those two worlds, but also, I think, do something totally new with you guys. And would you say it's like, 
it's that it's harder than than the work you're doing public radio harder yeah i mean it's it's incredibly creatively challenging right because we're coming up with literally new forms of telling stories. As you guys may know, whether we're talking about radio storytelling or we're talking about print storytelling, there are templates, there are formats that you typically, you go back to over and over and over again. And the daily, I think, threw those out the window. So it's, it's an incredible challenge. It's an exciting one, it's really fun. But I mean, how many times have we just lost hours and hours? I mean, I've sat in that tiny little studio for eight, 10 hours with you guys. The, the time flies, so it's, it's a total pleasure, but it's actually exhausting. I don't know how you do it every day. I don't either. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and you also come from public radio, yeah. and I wonder how when reporters from the Times come on the show and they, and they don't really know what to expect, right. and they're intimidated by it, maybe a little bit thrown by it, how do you describe to them what the daily is? How do you essentially put them at ease? Well, I think a lot of reporters aren't uh, are, are used to telling the stories in the way that they write them, and um, and and we have to kind of like shake them out of that muscle memory a bit because we like to tell the story of the news rather than just the news itself. What do you mean by that? So finding a narrative within the story itself. So maybe that means that the the the, the story actually starts last week instead of what happened today. Maybe it means it starts a month ago. Maybe we have to go all the way back to the Cold War and learn about this battle, and then we're going we're gonna to take you chronologically to now. And then when you get there, you understand why the news matters so much. And, um, but you have to, oftentimes reporters want to just tell you the news right away, because that's like, that's their job. It's the most important thing they can do. And we keep being like, no, 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 and then, and we slowly walk them up to, yeah. up to the news. Yeah, we, in the first couple of months, I didn't understand this at all, but journalists have a tendency to vomit the news out yeah. and to tell the whole thing. And we would sit, we'd have reporters, even ones you love now, and I won't mention their names. Um, <laughs> I won't. Um, they'd come on the show and, and we'd ask them, we'd have this carefully prepared script, as Annie's saying, that was a, a narrative. Because I think what you're describing is, is this notion that the news, in a sense, on the daily comes last, mm -hmm. that you earn the new information because right. we have told you the story from a starting point you never even imagined. Right. And reporters would come in and we'd ask them a question and they would tell the entire story in one answer. Yeah. And we'd have to be like, that was so great. You're amazing. <laughs> um, we spe you we so specialize in the, in the... How do you affirmation get, sandwich? The affirmation, yeah, the shit sandwich. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was so great. Now we're gonna do it all over again. We're just but the whole so thing smart. all over again. Yeah. And that's why Caitlin spends ten hours in the studio. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, it was all Not about just you. You're saying I don't get it right the first time. <laughs> no, hearing you say this is actually it's giving me pause because that, that affirmation sandwich I've gotten from you, Anne. Well, you are so, so great. So many times. You are. You're so so smart, and we have to do it again. <laughs> But I mean, it's, yeah. so, it's so peculiar. The daily is so peculiar because we start with a newsroom full of about 1,300 reporters who are a font of story ideas, and we bring in producers and audio folks who really know that medium, and we marry them, and we ask the reporters to trust the producers, to put themselves in their hands, and tell these stories that are turned totally inside out in ways that are totally antithetical if you listen to the daily and you actually read the New York Times and you put those two side by side, the way we tell stories on the daily are, is completely antithetical to the way a journalist tells a story. The way I was trained to tell a story, and I assume the same for you, is you put the new information at the top. You don't hold anything in suspense. Why would you possibly do that? People are busy. They want the news. Right. And what people like Annie bring to the daily is this kind of, this rich history and understanding that the best stories are told slowly and richly and with human voices and suspense and drama unfurling that way. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard for me mm. to understand at first. And in the beginning we were trying to do this with news, which was kind of a, um, which we thought was sort of the, the innovation of the daily was to tell, talk, talk about the news, but tell it like a story. And as, as we got a few more producers and we started getting faster and people started getting more sleep, we were able to, <laughs> We were able to, to take on larger projects that right. were a little more ambitious or we could spend a few more days on or maybe a week on. And, and our first story we made together was one of these more ambitious projects, one of our first kind of big narrative pieces on, on the daily where we actually sent a producer with Caitlin to, to report this story. Um, yeah. yeah. 
that was an incredible story and we had an incredible amount of material to put it yeah. together. Annie, dear Annie, spent, my God, how many hours <laughs> listening to the tape that we gathered. So this is actually, it's a piece that, it was the first story idea that I walked in the door with and that I pitched to my editors. And this will make sense to you eventually, but when I pitched it, it seemed like a sort of bizarre, weird, you know, narrow, but really interesting feature story. And then over the months that I reported it, it became clear that actually it was something much larger. It really was, in many ways, the story of the 2016 election and the story of this really dramatic cultural shift in our country that, that again, this will sound familiar to you eventually, um, you know, as it relates to immigration, to race, to religion. So we'll tell you the story in true daily fashion and sort of back into it. It starts, <laughs> I'm not gonna give it away. It starts with a rumor. A rumor that started to spread in a city in Idaho called Twin Falls. Mm. And the rumor was that a five-year-old girl in Twin Falls had been sexually assaulted by a group of Syrian refugees who held her at knife point. And this was really tearing this city apart. I mean, everybody was engaged. People were, had really, really strong feelings on both sides. You know, all around this issue of refugee resettlement, it's a town with quite a few refugees, and people heard this story, and, and for many people, they said, you know, we need to stop this. We need to get them out of here. We, need to, we can't resettle refugees here anymore. And, and then it grew, and it wasn't just Twin Falls. The story started to be picked up elsewhere by other news outlets with, with really large followings, mm -hmm. and it built. Yeah, so let's, let's play that clip. So starting that night, you start to see blog posts pop up in places like Jihad Watch, like Refugee Resettlement Watch. And the headlines repeat this very scary set of facts. Three Syrian refugees rape little girl at Knife Point in Idaho before urinating on her body. Then it starts to show up on local Fox News affiliates. Who in the media is focusing on this five-year-old girl in a rape case? Idaho should be the clarion call of every suburban mom out there. The reason I'm obsessing over Islamic, 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 Islamic. That's the big story. And I think the peak really is when it hits Drudge. It's the main story, banner headline, Syrian refugees rape five-year-old girl at knife point in Idaho. But the problem is none of those scary details turn out to be true. This is definitely the moment where I say, we'll be right back. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, it is. Producer? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, sorry. You, you, but continue. What, what were you saying? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I should say, so, it, so the details in that scary story turn out to be untrue, but as you all know, it, you know, it's, it's really the story of fake news, and, and it was seized upon by a group of people who saw in, in a, a grain of truth, you know, there really was an incident involving a five-year-old girl and other young boys who were refugees, though they were not Syrians, um, and they did end up being charged with a crime in, in, in juvenile court. Um, but, you know, the story, the, the true story was seized upon by a group of people who saw in it the potential to get a lot of excitement around their ideas. Did you hear Alex Jones in there, everybody? Alex mm -hmm. Jones was in there. Steve Bannon was in there. Yeah, Steve Bannon really picks up this story and it's like, this is, is the 2016 election. Yeah, this, was, this is ahead of... Steve mm -hmm. Bannon, I believe, becoming one of the top people in the campaign. He was, in fact, talking about this story on Breitbart Radio up until days before he got a job with the Trump campaign. He was obsessed with this story, and, and soon enough, many people across the country were obsessed with this story. So that's what I mean when I say it seemed like a sort of narrow, weird, bizarre tale, and then I learned that it was actually the tale that animated this election and, and that helped Donald Trump become president. Yeah. Yeah, and there's there's one Breitbart reporter. So Breitbart is the this is the news organization, the organization that that Steve Bannon head up, head headed up. Now he's not heading up, heading it up no longer. But he at the time was heading up Breitbart News, and he had sent out his um, his bulldog reporter to continue to cover this story and to and even when it was clear that that the that the facts were no longer true, he um, sent out this reporter. And one of my favorite parts of this story and of making this story with Caitlin is that. When you're in audio, you can, you can capture a moment where a reporter confronts their sources 
in a way that you can never do in the paper, where in the paper you sort of see like they didn't respond to comment or they disagreed or you can say what they think and then you can write the facts afterwards. But when you can hear Caitlin push him right. on, on these facts and just like offer a contradictory set of facts from the narrative that he's laying out, it's so powerful and you're just like cheering her on. Um, and so we're gonna play a clip of this, which is two moments layered on top of each other. Um, and just so you know what's going on in the clip, the, um, this man, Lee Stranahan from Breitbart, had been known to say that the mayor of this town in Idaho, Twin Falls, that the mayor was a supporter of Sharia law. So we'll, we'll play the clip. As improbable as that may be. Yes. Do you honestly think that it's possible that the mayor of Twin Falls is a, is a Sharia supporter? Did you think no, that at the time? I, no, I, I don't. I think I probably, I mean, if I said that, I probably followed up by saying no. <laughs> He's no you not just left it out there. I mean, I'll play it for you. I'll send it to you after we finish. You just left it out there. Yeah, I'd have to hear what it was. I've been very clear before. Lee, even... what does any of it have to do with Twin Falls? There are no Syrians in Twin Falls. I mentioned it because Syrians. I know those numbers offhand. I know, I, I can tell you what the Syrian, and by the way, there are Syrians coming to Twin Falls. I don't know how to. But there's there something were. amazing about being able to see that, like, interaction, even if, it, even if nothing really comes at it. There's not like a quote. That well, did he gonna... just wiggle? Did he just wiggle out of that? He tried to. He tried to do that a lot. And I, I totally agree with Annie that there was only so much that I could do to convey this man's style of communication, one that was incredibly compelling to a lot of people. He has a huge following. Um, there was only so much that I could do to write that. And I think hearing it is the most satisfying experience because I'm basically playing the part of my reader, of my audience. And I, you know, I'm asking the question that anybody is as they're reading the story in the New York Times Magazine where it originally appeared, which is like, what are you talking about? What you're describing has nothing to do with the facts on the ground in Twin Falls. I mean, he's a really, really interesting guy, and I think there's a lot for us to take away from understanding the way that he communicates because, you know, I described it actually like, like trying to talk to a pinball because he, <laughs> he'd be in one place, and so I'm there with him, you know, and he's, he's making these arguments about refugee resettlement. So I, he says, you know, he says something, and I'm like, okay, well, what about this? But then he's all the way over here, and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go there with you. Like, well, what about this fact? Did you consider that? And then he's over here, and he, he, he's so frenetic. He's jumping around, and he's making these arguments that originally I was trying to actually understand and wrap my mind around, and then all, there was sort of an epiphany moment where I realized, oh, he doesn't actually care nearly as much about making a sort of airtight, logical, policy-oriented argument. His focus, what he's most passionate about, is being able to express his views, to put them forward, and to not be dismissed by the mainstream media, to not be called a racist, or to not be called you know, a crazy person. And so, and, and right, like that's actually the story of the election, that is fake news, this, this phrase. We hear it applied all the time to facts, to things that are true. So Lee Stranahan got that, he capitalized on it, and, and us being able to sort of hear this exchange, I think, just makes that so clear. Yeah, and one of the things that I think has been transformational within the Times, and I hope for listeners too, about the Daily and the way we're telling stories is that I think we've kind of opened up the journalistic process in a way that it didn't ever get opened up before. And when you think about the way that the Times arrives on your doorstep, if it arrives on your doorstep, given your ages, and... And we hope it does. <laughs> your recycling patterns and all the rest, is like, for the longest time, the way that w newspapers existed in people's lives was that we kind of were this thing handed down to you. Like, a newspaper story is ultimately kind of like a, a set of tablets that come from the mountain, and the way that the Times stories have been written for so long, and I think this has changed a lot in the last few years, but it was kind of voice of God. And you got the news, you're welcome for the news. If you have any questions about the news in small print, here's a number you can call with a, you know, mm -hmm. like, a, like a voicemail system or whatever. And I think that that has led to a lot of kind of confusion about what the media is and about how journalism works. And for me, that really hit home after the 2016 election, right. when I think a lot of news organizations, including the Times, 
were called out afterward for what we did or didn't do and the conclusions we did or didn't lead people to about what was going to happen and who was going to win. Right. And I think one of the solutions that just kind of ha happened after the election was the daily and the transparency of things like that interview. I mean, it's just, it's so much harder to just trust a reporter like Caitlin when you see her process that suddenly transparent to you and there's no longer a tablet being handed down to you. I, I, I don't know if you find that that has been powerful, but I think it's, oh, it's, it's certainly huge. changed my whole approach to the news. Absolutely, it's been huge. I mean, I, I've always been a fan of of any opportunity to explain to people when I'm out on the road what it is that I do, what the values and the rules that I have to follow are, and those conversations are happening more and more and more, and, and I'm happy to have them. But there was a, a major shift even, you know, immediately after this Twin Falls story publishes in the New York Times Magazine, immediately you have Lee Stranahan, Breitbart, and, and a lot of their following coming after me on Twitter and saying, you know, that I lied and I misrepresented him, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the Daily episode came out, was it a week later, yeah. a mm -hmm. few days later? They actually, they really went quiet. And it was because you could hear Lee Stranahan saying right. things that weren't true. You could hear me calling him out for saying things that weren't true. It was irrefutable. Mm -hmm. And that was a really powerful That's moment for me. I didn't know that. That's And then it was great because I just had a clip that I could send them when they would accuse me of something. I'd be like, <laughs> please see here. Yeah. It was great. Great. <laughs> Yeah. More, you just like kept sending audio clips. I did, I did. I pointed people to the audio. I said, if you want right. it, if you if you have a gripe, listen to it yourself, and then let's talk about it. And then you know, I didn't get a lot of calls back after mm. that. Is Lee Stranahan still covering this? This story, yeah, he's he's still covering everything. He's still very active, and he's still very actively mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Caitlin, you want Lee Stranahan? He, um, well, I should actually know. This is sort of interesting. Is that he left? Um, this made it into the story, I believe, in, in time. He shortly after uh, Steve Bannon ended up actually in the White House, Trump was elected, then Lee ended up leaving Breitbart because he, he was a huge fan, idolized Steve Bannon. Um, before that, he'd been a protege of Andrew Breitbart's. And so he left disgruntled that Bannon was gone, and he took a job at Sputnik, which is a Russian The Russian state-funded news, right, news agency. Right, exactly. <laughs> Russia needs news too. Right, that's true. <laughs> um, and Caitlin, <laughs> after, after that, and many other great stories, uh -huh. and your turn as guest host on the daily, you end up breaking arguably the biggest immigration story of the year or many years, and keeping it vague daily style. Can you tell us about the process by which you broke that story? Sure. I think a lot of people, when they think about an immigration reporter, they're envisioning me walking through the desert, you know, going back and forth across the border, going into immigration detention and interviewing people there. The reality is the government doesn't let me in. I mean, I'm, I'm at the border frequently enough, um, but especially in the last year, a lot of my focus has been covering policy. You know, what is the administration thinking about doing? Who supports it? Who doesn't? How close are we to actually seeing this put into place? And a lot of that reporting happens in, in a lot less interesting a location. It happens on my couch in Brooklyn, um, largely between the hours of like 10 p.m. and 1 in the morning. Because I'm talking to people who work for the federal government, and of course they can't sit, call me up from their desk mm -hmm. and say, hey, Stephen Miller just uh, came up with this new idea, and it, it looks like it's, it's going to come through. So it's a lot of late nights, a lot of weekends. That's what my life looks like. And over a series of months in the last year, it was conversations like those that led me to be able to report initially that, that the Trump administration was considering and then eventually that they were actually implementing the separation of migrant parents and children. I think you're being a little humble. You, I mean, you broke the story of family separation. It's good to know that people listen. It, it's good to know that people listen. Immigration is a, is a topic that, um, you know, for 11 months of the year, not as many people are interested in. And mm -hmm. that's probably not true here because we're in California. I grew up here. I know how, I know how um, you know, animating an issue it is to people here. But, 
yeah, it was, it, it, it surprised me as much as anybody else. I mean, when I first heard about the idea of family separation, even the government officials who were telling me about it were saying, you know, this is, this is basically a starting point in a negotiation. It's so far flung and so extreme that no one will ever approve it. And then, you know, six months later, there we were. Mm. And I wonder if you can remind people, because it's like utterly fascinating how bureaucracies work. Mm -hmm. Briefly, like the, the process by which workaday people inside the federal government ended up creating and implementing family separation without even necessarily knowing they were doing it. Yeah, so here's what happened, and, and this is why you know, the story had to be broken in the way that it was, is because it was this policy idea that I knew was being batted around. At some point, I got wind that it had made it to Kirsten Nielsen, the Secretary of Homeland Security's desk, and she needed to sign off, and the White House needed to sign off, and, and that was it. So we knew that it was pretty close, but then the conversation just kind of went dark. We didn't hear anything. And by like, the conversation, you mean like what you're hearing on the couch? What I'm hearing like on the couch, you know, because I'm, I'm checking in with people and I'm yeah. asking, where is this? Is mm -hmm. this moving forward? What, what's the deal with this policy? And they're like, we haven't heard anything. We don't know what's going on. Right. And then what I started to hear from them is, well, we're hearing about isolated cases of family separations here and there, but we don't really know what's going on. We don't really know why. Um, you know, then eventually I hear from a lawyer at the ACLU, and I should say, you know, advocates along the border, they're telling me for months as well, they're seeing separations, but we just don't know, you know, they're isolated cases. We don't have any data. Um, we don't know how, how big a deal this is. And then ben eventually I hear from a lawyer at the ACLU, he was about to file the lawsuit that, that now you're all familiar with because it's the lawsuit that eventually forces the reunifications. And he says to me, I have this mother and child and it's not just them, these are happening everywhere. That was what empowered me to, to go to these government officials and get better information. So the way that, that government officials actually sort of stumble upon for the first time the realization that family separations are happening is, is because hundreds and hundreds of kids had showed up at these shelters that, that are used to house the children. And they didn't know what to do with the kids. They were, they were young, they, they, were, they were too young to have crossed the border on their own. Um, they were completely out of sorts, very distressed, and they were saying that they'd come with their parents and they didn't know where their parents were. And so eventually that agency has to reach out to, th those shelters are overseen by the Health and Human Services Department. That agency has to reach out to DHS and say, look, we have all these kids who are saying that they were taken away from their parents, what's going on? We don't know where their parents are. We don't know how to take care of them. And DHS says, okay, uh, they, they, so they ask for help. HHS says, can you help us find, find the parents? And DHS says, okay, yeah, we'll help them. Can you send us a list? HHS creates a list and it has about 700 names and that becomes the first official accounting of actual separated children and that's the first time that I'm able to report it because once there's a paper trail and once enough people have seen it then I can get access to it. Hmm. Hmm. And that's really just the beginning because the disorganization and um, just the sort of chaos is, 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 it exists throughout the implementation of this policy all the way up until the reunification process. I think one of the crazy things for me I was I was not in news before the daily I was just I was an uh, audio producer in like narrative shows nonfiction but not news and I hadn't really thought about news breaking because like a person found out something <laughs> like I sort of thought of, like news just kind of happened and then like it was written about in this sort of like impersonal way mm -hmm. but I think one of the cool things that the, that the daily is able to do is by like following Caitlin through her reporting process you're like oh you just heard a thing and then you kept asking and you heard a few more things and now the whole world knows about something that they wouldn't have known about otherwise. And of course there are other people who are doing similar work and everyone is like, you know, you work on a team, but there's but there are people who are who are get who are hounding these agencies, the administration, like mm -hmm. structures to to get the news. And I think that that being able to follow that is one of the most exciting things about the show. And we and there's there's part of the daily we did on um, we did a, uh, we decided to do a series with Caitlin, which is really kind of the next step of this process. You know, it's new, we, we initially we were only making news. Then we we're okay. We're going to make bigger stories. We're going to make narratives. We're going to go into the field with reporters. And then when there are stories like this and amazing guests like Caitlin, we can actually step back and say, okay, can we tell this story? It, can we tell the whole story? And can we take up more than one day of the mm -hmm. daily? And so we're, okay, we're going to make a series with Caitlin about this. And um, this was done by two of my colleagues, not by myself. And 
it's one of my favorite moments of, of the series. And it's really when an email to a government organization becomes like a drama. And I think that's just such a cool thing. And so if we can play the next clip. So I type up an email to DHS on April 17th. We're preparing to publish a story based on information that we've received from several DHS sources on background, which shows that more than 700 children have been separated from their parents by immigration authorities since last October. We wanted to run this by you to ensure that DHS doesn't care to add context findings or further comment. Why have these separations occurred? Are these separations occurring more often? Has a decision the about whether to adopt a policy of family separation for the purposes of deterrence been made? Why or why not? If my deadline is noon tomorrow, please be in touch as soon as possible. And then I hit send. I mean, if you never told me that we would make an email sexy, <laughs> like we did. Um, and I'm glad we did because, you know, so... By the way, how do we even make that? Like, that was, was that you typing? Yeah, that was so awkward. <laughs> there was a producer, Lindsay Garrison, genius, came and sat at my desk one day and, and watched me work. It was really creepy. And so, eventually, and so I'm just sitting there typing and eventually I start to tell her like, okay, now I'm going to call this person, now I'm going to call that person, like, because you're still sitting here. Um, so it was a combination of recording me typing at my desk and then also having me read these emails that went back and forth between me and people in Washington when we were getting ready to report this because, you know, what a lot of people envision and what a lot of people in Washington would have you think is that a New York Times reporter hears one thing once, a rumor, and then it's just like immediately in the newspaper and that's absolutely not the case. And that was especially true with family separation because not only did we have to dog the administration to, to get the facts of what was happening, but we, ha we actually, I mean, they, they told me that it wasn't true and, and that's a new experience for me. So, you know, as being, I- Being lied to? Yeah. And your whole life? <laughs> by, uh, by a spokesperson, yeah. by, right. by a spokesperson for the federal government. Um, typically, you know, when I'm writing a story that the agency that, that's connected to it doesn't like, they don't respond, they no comment, mm -hmm. or they give me some comment that is totally about a different topic, so that I can't write that they didn't comment even though they, in effect, didn't comment. Um, but with this administration, you know, I went to them with the information, and they told me it wasn't true. They told me they were not separating families, that I would be you know, misleading the public if I wrote that they were. They told me that my sources were lying to me. They told me that the documents that I had been given were fake, and there, there was no family separation. So I wrote that email, um, and, I, and I lay it out, and I say, this is all the information that I have, this is all the evidence. Um, you know, and when the federal government tells you that your story's untrue and that mm -hmm. you're going to be misleading the public, we take that very seriously. That's a really big deal. And so there were days where I said, okay, give me evidence. Tell me what it is that I have wrong. Help me understand how this is untrue, you know, what I've misrepresented here. So as I'm waiting for them to get back to me after I, you know, send this email and I give them my deadline, I'm calling more and more people, more and more officials who are by now familiar with what's going on. And I'm saying, hey, I have this data the government's telling me that it's untrue. Can you confirm this data if you can? You know, tell me how, how you know that it's true or not true um, so that I can feel confident about your corroboration or not. You know, I'm calling like person after person after person after person and every day I'm writing back to the same spokesperson at DHS and I'm saying like, just got another one, just got another one, just got another one. More and more people are validating these numbers and we're gonna go to print and then finally after several days, they come back to me, they say that they have, uh, they've tracked down the discrepancy Hmm. and they're going to get back to me with a comment. And just to give you a sense of how... Um, just to give you a sense of how relentless this current occupant of the White House and the people around him are, after this series ran, yes. you have to be careful here, careful here about attribution, as they warned us. We heard from the White House. We heard from people in, in, in the administration with a long list of what they claimed were flaws in, in the series that one by one, Caitlin and Annie Correal looked at and said, wrong, wrong, not right, not I think right. it was like 22 bullet points yeah. or something like that yeah. that they thought was inaccurate. And that's actually, honestly, that's regular. It's a regular occurrence for me now. Pretty much every time I write a story, I get a phone call 
telling me that it's wrong, and then I have to go through this exercise where I say, okay, give me your evidence, and then, you know. Yeah, and we're going to come back with Maggie Haberman in, the, in a couple of months, and then she can tell you all about what it's like to cover this administration, so we won't overly dwell mm -hmm. on it. But it's extraordinary. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And there was a, as just a, as a listener of these stories, because I, I wasn't a part of the making, I felt like one of the most impactful parts of it was that of all the news I read and and pictures I had seen that I hadn't actually heard any of the kids, like just to hear their little voices mm -hmm. was... The separated children. The separated children was like, kind of took my breath away. And I, I felt like that was such a, you know, th there was that, that audio that went around from, I think ProPublica recorded the, right at the beginning of, of the, uh, after the news had broken, that this is from the detention center and you could hear the children crying and it went viral because just to hear children brings it home in this mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And what you and Annie Coriol were able to do in talking to these children was to bring this whole process home and what has happened to the children. Um, and so we have a clip of that also. <laughs> Te fuiste dónde? ¿Qué? Duro. Te fuiste duro? Te caíste? No? Ya estás con tu mamá. Just a tiny clip there, just like, just to, but the her little voice, the te fuiste duro, and there's. We have a lot of Spanish speakers on staff. It's like extraordinary. Yeah, but it's it, it's I think it's just such an important uh, addition to the coverage. I agree. That audio was gathered by Annie Coriel, another reporter. She covers New York City, and she went around and talked to a lot of families. And even for me hearing that, I mean, some of it I heard for the first time when I listened to the episode that you guys put together, it really gave me pause because I, I was supposed to be this person who'd been paying attention to family separation from the very beginning. I thought that I understood this story from every single angle. I'm supposed to be the expert. and you know, not to sound too cheesy or, or like an audio nerd, but um, I do think that that brought something entirely different to the table. You know, these kids aren't analyzing policy. They're not even telling us in a coherent way exactly how they feel or, or how it impacted them. But I, I think the sound of the human voice tells us something bigger than that. And I think it's something that we can only convey to our audience through a medium like the daily. So that's, mm. that's why I'm so grateful. I feel like that's the full story. Mm. And so this series that you and Annie were part of, like, it was designated as a two-part thing. We call, a two-part uh, Three parts. Excuse me, three parts, originally three parts. Yeah. And we called it Divided. Mm -hmm. And we're off to the races with this thing. Beautiful first episode. We're hearing a ton of feedback from The from reaction listeners. was massive. Was massive. Yeah. Tons and tons of emails yeah. after day one. And so, you know, when I know I'm going to be on the show, I wake up in the morning, first thing, I ask Alexa to turn the show on. And I don't hear my <laughs> voice. I hear someone else's voice. So we're going to play what she actually heard instead. Joe Kahn, we were going to do part two in our series on family separations for today's show. That was our plan. You're the managing editor of The Times. You're kind of all of our bosses here. Tell us why we can't or maybe shouldn't do that. Well, it happens to be likely the most disruptive day in the Trump presidency so far. I have to say, if you're going to... Okay, let's start oh, at... No, no, that's it. Oh, I was just going to say, if you're going to wake up in the morning and, um, and hear that your series has been interrupted... You know, you've been preempted. That I've been preempted. Joe Kahn is, is maybe you know one of the very few people's voices who I who I wanted to hear. I figured you know if they if they brought Joe into the studio, I think that was probably the right call. And just people know who Joe Kahn is because I think before I worked at a newspaper, I didn't understand who a managing editor was. He's number two at the yeah. at, at at the paper, and so yeah, he's he's a he's one of the apostles. He's a guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what had happened, of course, was that while we're in the middle of this series, news happened, and ultimately we are a news show. And while we make, do we make documentaries and we can feel like a documentary series show, yeah. and we can feel like a feature show, we're ultimately a news show. And in the middle of this series, two things happened. I remember them vividly, because I was in Texas 
at an event was first um, Michael Cohen decides to do a plea agreement with the U.S. attorney in Manhattan, which has implications for the special counsel investigation, and then within 10 minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, <laughs> do it again. Paul, yeah, one more time. <laughs> it's Thursday. <laughs> okay, then, this is what it's really like. He's so obedient. It's really good. And, <laughs> and then, two minutes later. Yes, very good. Paul Manafort pleads guilty. Right. Uh, enters a plea agreement. One more time. And so we had this extraordinary news event. And, and as it happened, while you're waking up in Brooklyn, a little disappointed by this news, I was in, as I said, Texas, and we suddenly had to make an episode remotely, which we'd never done before. But this was after, like, massive resistance. We did not want to make this episode. Yeah. No one was more disappointed by these two men doing these two deals. <laughs> than the three of us. But yeah. the people who were involved in the making of the daily. But I want to know, what was that What night? were they thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Were they not listening? Did they not know that we had part two to get to? But I want to know what that night was like for you, because one of my favorite things is when Michael goes on Twitter at like 6 p.m. after a big story breaks, and he says, host puts one show to the side and begins another show. I immediately am like, oh, this is going to be a really good one tomorrow. I have we to have listen. Some, I mean, we, we, we do this a lot less than we used to, tearing up the show. At the, at the beginning of the day, we tore up the show twice a week, three times a week, and it was, it, it was, I mean, it was a nightmare because, you know, we'd be at the office, I, I mean, until the sun rose. Um, and that night, that afternoon, being in Texas, I have this little microphone kit and I travel with it, you know, like a little tallest one, like, kind of take it with me. And, um, and I, I rigged a system by which I, I put the microphone in a trash bin at the hotel, put the trash bin on a desk, put some pillows behind it, got on the phone with Joe Kahn in the studio, and used another iPhone to record my own voice. Wow. Through my, anyway, it's really ugly looking mm -hmm. um, in the room, and that's how we did that episode. You couldn't and, tell. Thank you. The quality was great. And then we return the next day to the series. Um, right. And it's, it's, it feels emblematic of really kind of the heart of the show, which is that, you know, we start off as a news show. We're able to expand out, become ambitious, do these narrative things. We want to make series. We want to dive in deep and follow Caitlin through her, like, writing an email. But really, we're just, we're, we need to explain the news. Yeah. And, um, and there's, there's, a, there's a certain raw energy that comes over the team when it's like, ah, we gotta cover the news now. Yeah. And then like we all kind of like, we're, like we're, you know, we have to like order dinner and get another coffee and then like make the show. And it's, it's really, it's just a, it's a different kind of fun. Yeah. For well, us more all. like largely a Thai operation, I would say. Food. Oh, food. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, you never wear a tie. I know, I was gonna say, I've <laughs> never seen you in a tie, Michael. <laughs> um, a slight warning, we're going to start to do question and answer in a few minutes. So if people want to line up, you can do that now. Right. But there, we're are, not there are apparently are microphones on either um, at the ends of either. Yes, that's right. I'm yeah. There. So okay. just a and warning. And we expect questions. <laughs> we do. We will be gravely disappointed if there are not questions. Yeah, come on down. That's there right. it is. Oh, so um, so then we finally re we resume this we resume the series and. We caught one of the episodes. We had to. Yes. Yeah. It happens. Um, so you ended up missing out in a final version on the sort of reunification process, which I mentioned earlier was you know, about as messy as the separation process. But I think, I mean, I wasn't in those conversations, but I think the calculation was, you know, the country's focus has shifted and it's this challenge the daily faces. I don't envy them for it. You know, we know that people are still really hungry to understand, you know, family separation and as great of detail as we can provide at the same time we know that you know there's this unprecedented change in terms of you know special prosecutor investigation and the future of the presidency and so to try to meet halfway was to decide you know okay we're going to trim the separation story down to its essential elements mm -hmm. and convey those so where is the family separation story that you first broke chronicled with great authority told on the daily now many times and beautifully what what is the status of that story 
So the status of the kids who were separated during that brief period um, is that the majority have been reunited with their parents, though there are still hundreds in custody, and it's going to take a long time to get all of those kids home because of the logistical challenges involved, because, you know, as we reported on the daily, the record keeping was at best uh, very poor, but at worst, I mean, non-existent. So, but, but there's a, a court order and a judge who is breathing down the government's neck to get those kids home. And then, you know, I think Washington is recalibrating. I'm seeing two things happen. I'm seeing, you know, some in the White House and some in the executive branch really still full steam ahead trying to figure out how to lock down the border, how to prevent people from coming. And, you know, if that didn't work, what else might? It's really a sort of throw spaghetti to the wall situation, you know, when I talk to people about the ideas um, that are being floated to try to, to limit um, northern migration. Um, but at the same time, I'm also seeing a lot more moderate ideas come out, uh, which is interesting, mm -hmm. and, and more moderate voices sort of bubbling up and, and seeming to play a larger role. Um, is what my sources are, are telling me. I think, you know, there are many who have realized that regardless of, of political party, the administration crossed a line for a lot of people with family separation. And so, you know, th there's a bit of recalibrating, a little, a little bit of moderating happening. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But, you know, I'm, I'm hearing these ideas come up now that are actually ideas that I heard about under Obama, that I heard about under Bush. So, um, you know, it, it, it could go one of two ways. But this is still the pet issue of the administration, and I, it's not going away. And you're not going away. I'm not going away. So before we go to Q&A. Right. We've been talking a lot about a lot of dark things. Yeah, this has been rather heavy. It's been heavy. kind of sad. Too sad. Pretty sad. So I think there's a way we're going to end this on a lighter note. Yes. Before we throw to you. Right. And an audio clip, not surprisingly. <laughs> and it's a, bit humili it's a bit humiliating, but not in, a fami not in the way that the earlier clips were. No. Annie, not quite. can you tell the story of what? Sure. So when we're, st when we're starting a new show with a new host, some of the fun things about it is that you have to get, you have to, you learn about someone's um, verbal tics. And as I'm sure you all know, Michael Barbaro has a very recognizable verbal tick. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> um, that comes in many forms. And it's a polarizing issue. We hear from, from all across, the, the, uh, on both sides of the aisle. People, people <laughs> hate it, some people love it. Um, it's very useful to us because it says, I'm hearing you, I'm listening, I understand, but it's not saying I agree with you, which is um, which It's, is, agno it's, it's, it's an agnostic sound. It is just a mm. um, And, and, for, and uh, is it anyone's birthday tonight? Nearby. It's Perfect. people's birthday, very good. Oh, so on place. Michael's birthday, we, we made him a special treat, which is now a treat for you. Um, and we're gonna play that now. And he made that. Well, yeah, it was easy. He, I didn't, he took I didn't, all the hums. But I didn't even have to pitch shift them. He just does them in all different. They're naturally pitches. that dynamic. They're just naturally that. I took one interview and I found all different hums. <laughs> that was from one interview. Yes. That's not accurate. It was. It was like with Mike Schmidt. You love. You're always. You're always. Mm, 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 mm. You're like. Mm. That's incredible. <laughs> it's true. People are so moved by Michael Barbaro's hmms. I have to say, when I guest hosted for the show, I had people email me and say, why are you trying to do Michael Barbaro's hmm? I was like, Michael didn't invent hmm. Everyone says hmm. <laughs> but so now apparently you own hmm. A funny trick that we do, and I'll give like one little trade secret, and Annie is very skilled at this, is she'll take a hmm and move it. And so if, like, if there's a weird need for a hmm, 
She'll they'll take it and they'll move it where it wasn't originally. Hmm. There's like a hmm library. Yeah, there's a hmm library. You also have to cut out so many hmms because he's hmm and all the time. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, we're done. Q and A. <laughs> Thank you. Master. What can um, I say? So why don't we start? Why don't we start on the right and then we'll go to the left and then we'll alternate. Great. As um, people do. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, Honestly, thank you, uh, just from all of us. It's, it's awesome to be. Uh, you, obviously, you've given us a gift, but you've, you've done more for you know, what you guys have given to thank the you. world. And, yeah, so thanks. Um, just question on Medium. Uh, so you've kind of been humble about it, but you've, you have advanced journalism in a really interesting way, and I'm just curious. Um, it's kind of weird. Like, audio is not new, right? So NPR, right? Um, and... Uh, FDR gave speeches to a yeah. radio and we all listened to it. So I'm curious, like, why now this? And then also, what, what do you see about the future of journalism given what you're seeing now in the last couple of years? Thanks. Annie, why now? We just talked about this. Oh, you mean like being able to see inside the... Well, I no, think... why audio? Like, why is audio having such a moment? Mm -hmm. Why is podcasting... Why well, is the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Vox, like, why are we all doing... Podcasts, I mean, so many of them. There's kind of the like the uh, familiar reasons that we you cite, where you can do it while you're washing the dishes. You you can listen while you're while you're traveling. It fits into your it fits into your your empty spaces. But I think that there is a kind of intimacy that comes with audio that is different from from video and it's different from print. And both of those mediums have their beautiful flourishes. And I think that. Uh, you're able to get close in this way and you're able to recreate scenes from history that then you animate with your own mind in a way that you can't really do in video because you're just watching, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think a, a video producer would probably disagree with me, but I, I feel like you can, it, it, you're, the, the mind can make more interesting pictures um, and, and can, can hold you and and fascinate you more than you can do, like turn around in a day, uh, a historical documentary mm -hmm. yeah. for, 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 the, for a daily news show. Um, and so I think that that's why it can be so powerful. Um, I'm not sure why, like, and then for news, I think that the, the reasons that we talked about are, are some of the... I think we arrive at a really kind of crucial and precarious moment in media, which is that cable news kind of broke itself and I, none of the people who write to us about listening to the daily, a lot of the people who write to us about listening to the daily, particularly younger listeners, talk about their utter disinterest in the kind of world of cable news and, the, and the, for all the reasons we don't have to itemize. I mean, it's, they're so familiar now. And, and the authenticity of the audio form and the kind of human connection, the human empathy, right. the kind of purity of it and is missing from almost every other part of the media. And I think that was the broken thing that we got to come in and kind of sweep up and, and excite people with something new around. Right. And it's like low enough, it's lo-fi enough where you can, we can make it in eight hours. Like that's the other thing. Where it's like you get to know the reporter, but we're not like, we don't have to be out in the field with them in order to tell their story in a really, in a really gripping way. And yeah. I think that that kind of media, that, that place is powerful. Yeah, it's a great question, though. Hi, I am a journalism student at USC, so I'm very Fantastic. interested in knowing your tricks of the trade. Um, so my question is, what was the hardest interview you've ever had to do on The Daily, and how did you deal with it? Um, the hardest interview I ever had to do on The Daily was the one where I cried, uh, which was the interview with a coal miner that happened really early on in the series. And it was hard because for whatever reason, was going on with me at that moment, um, kind of just like ha just like spilled over into the interview, and I think it was had a lot to do with the fact that the 2016 election made me made me like question how much I actually knew what I was doing, how much as a national political reporter I actually understood what I was covering, and I felt a little unmasked in that moment when the election was over, and I felt like we hadn't quite captured it and maybe miss something really essential. And this coal miner came on the show and, and was turning the interview back on me and asking me what I knew about coal mining and about his life. And he, he was so graceful in the way he challenged me rather than cable news style 
And I just, I just started to cry during the interview. And it was, and it, that was hard because I became self-conscious of crying and I'm, I'm doing the interview and it's like, it's, a, it's really hard. And uh, so that more than interviewing James Comey or the EPA director or anybody else, that was the hardest interview we did. And we had a really long discussion afterward about what was appropriate to keep in the interview. Mm -hmm. Like, well, why, does, why do people need to see my emotion? I, right. The show's not about me. Also, like, do I look like an idiot? Do I look like somebody who missed their therapy session that week? <laughs> and, um, and I never do. <laughs> um, <laughs> never, ever. Um, especially the new psychiatrist, what he charges. Um, New York? And 36 hour windows of cancellations. Is like... That's just cruel. Unbelievable. Man. Is like... So that was by far the, the hardest ever. Yeah. Hi. Um, so with journalism, a lot of times the power is in the questions that you ask. Um, right now with the war on news and every piece of news being political, I was just wondering, has that affected the way you ask questions and do you put more thought into which questions that you're asking to make things not seem as politicized um, or does that affect the integrity of the news? Hmm. 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 <laughs> I mean, I think that we're... Someone wrote us an email recently saying, I wish you'd ask the reporter how they knew that thing they told you they knew. And sometimes I think the mistake we make is thinking that you all know how Caitlin works. Like when Caitlin just explained, of course you would never rely on one source. The thing we wrestle with is how much we want to get in the process and is that really interesting to people? Does it advance the story? Does it interrupt the story? If I ask Caitlin how she knows something 10 times in the interview, Am I actually raising more questions about her? So like, we do wrestle with that a lot, uh, especially when someone like Mike Schmidt comes on and, 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 and Maggie Haberman, they rely on a lot of anonymous sourcing. You know, I think it's incumbent upon us to start to, to decode that process for our listeners. Mm -hmm. How do you know the thing you know mm -hmm. is a question I kind of wish we asked more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, totally. I, I think it, it was interesting we, when the anonymous op-ed was published and we spoke to the, um, after being rejected by whoever wrote the op-ed, we were like, we'll do an interview with you and you can just change your voice and yeah, it'll be said, great. Yeah, he said, he or she should know. Yes, um, but we talked to the, the editor of uh, the Opinion Desk and the, I think within that interview there was, a, there was this, at the heart of it was this question of like, people are, it's weird that this is being published in the Times when the people who already don't believe that the Times is true will think that this anonymous source is just fake. It's like you're, you're, th there's a kind of like self-consciousness that if we publish something with an anonymous source, people won't take it as seriously. And so I think that there is such a desire to have, to have concrete evidence and to prove your kind of like the, the to show your work because of this. Yeah. Um, but and then I loved the Bob Woodward interview where Bob Woodward who. Um, who, who just is releasing a book, but also um, was crucial in the Watergate, uh, in the reporting on Watergate, when he explained, like, we have to rely on these, what he calls deep background sources or anonymous sources, that that is the way that we take down, or that's the way that we understand. And he's, he's gone after every, every president of all sides. And having, like, sort of holding those two things in tension, where one is, no one's gonna believe us unless we have these sources, and the other is, we're never going to get the full story. Never going to get the full story on. unless we, unless you really, uh, unless you allow people to not go on the record. Um, I think the the thing we can do is just show people mm -hmm. that that is the that that is what reporters do, and then struggle with it. And um, and I think that that's really valuable. Shauna. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Uh, so grateful to have you all here in LA. And I think you're kind of touching on this question already, but for me as a listener, it certainly felt like when the show began, like the divisiveness of the country and kind of unifying both sides was certainly, it felt like an explicit goal of the show, whether mm -hmm. or not it was, especially the Cool Miner episode and others where I really felt like I was learning more about um, folks who maybe I wouldn't have otherwise. Is that still a goal of the Daily? Do you feel like that shifted given the current climate? It was pretty explicit. I mean, you know, the, the founders of the show, and you know one of them really well, Lisa Tobin, um, you know, they had this idea in their head that The Daily was gonna be completely bleached of anything 
approaching opinion that it was not going to contain even one iota of people's assumed like political leanings within the times. I mean, the sort of the coastal elite notion that we are, that we all think the same way, we all dress in the same store, we all read the same periodicals. We don't. Um, that was a that was an explicit kind of goal at the founding of the of the show, and I think what that necessitated was a series of conversations with people who maybe the Times isn't as known for having conversations with. So it was the coal miner. It was a former white nationalist. It was Shannon Mulcahy. You know, a steel worker who'd lost her job, who believed in President Trump, believed he would save her job. It was a farmer in California, Caitlin, one of the first conversations you ever had mm -hmm. with uh, a, a large farm owner who employs many undocumented immigrants who voted for Trump knowing full well that the president might have those workers who he considers family deported, but just believed it would never happen to him. And then the deportation started. Mm -hmm. And Caitlin talked. And like, so we, but we wanted, we wanted those to be the most nuanced conversations imaginable. Like we never wanted to make you feel like you knew the familiar narrative, and we never wanted to make the person being interviewed feel like they were a familiar part of the narrative. Mm -hmm. We interviewed a gun store owner who had sold a gun that was used in the Virginia Tech mass shooting. It was, he sold it, that was his gun. And instead of starting that interview by putting him on the defensive, we spent 20 minutes just talking to him about being a gun store owner. And I think the respect that the conversation showed him meant that he told us all sorts of things that were quite counterproductive to him, but that were really honest including the fact that a woman had committed suicide in, in the parking lot right after he sold her a gun and he felt so terrible. And so I think um, there's just not a lot of respectful conversation with people who were presumed to be in different places and, and, mm -hmm. and have different viewpoints. And, like, and that was always the goal of the daily. And I think it, I think it comes through. Yeah, I think and the so. reality is that those interviews end up being some of the most well listened to, some of the most popular. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. I think always we're looking for something that's gonna like challenge people's assumptions. So that's like uh, that's a pretty constant. I, I I think you know in the beginning it was like we want to you know bring together people from uh, both sides of the aisle. But I think in general, if there's ever a moment where you're like, huh, like that's not what I would have thought they would have said. Like we're hungry for that feeling. Um, and and so when we when we go looking for stories outside of like what we must cover so we can explain what's going on in the country the most necessary stories, when we're looking for those stories that are, that are more featurey, that are just kind of like, we're looking for those moments where, where you come away from the, from the interview feeling different than you did before. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sean. Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm from India, I just wanted to say that when my parents visit, they do listen to the podcast and they're back in India and they still, I think, listen to it every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so you have at least a couple of fans in India. That's so um, cool. You know, the girl there actually asked the question that I was going to ask, um, but maybe a follow-up question to that. I know the country is really polarized right now. Do you guys ever get any feedback from um, Trump supporters? Like, do you feel like you're making a change to people's opinions or the way they're thinking about things after the elections? And sorry, a second question, and you guys can choose which one you want to answer. I want to be respectful to everyone. Is which is, do you listen to another political podcast besides yours, obviously, or, or a podcast that covers the Trump administration? And if you do, why? What do you like about that? Mm. Who wants to tackle that last one? Yeah. I can, I can tackle the first one. Thank you. I mean, I can say covering, um, as somebody who covers immigration, I hear from conservatives a lot, um, from Trump supporters a lot, and I always appreciate it. I'll be honest. Changing anyone's mind, no matter what side of the aisle they're on, is not an everyday experience for me. I think it's a rare experience, um, but but it does happen. You know, in in many directions. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, when they heard the farmer who was a conservative in the Central Valley, um, a lot of liberals had you know a new appreciation for his perspective. So you know. A dramatic shift, you know, somebody changing their voter registration, that doesn't happen very much. But I do, in the emails that I get, you know, hear people saying in small ways that they were able to identify with somebody who they never would have crossed paths with um, day to day. And, 
you know, as we've said, that that to me is so powerful and so important because that's the goal, right? Like that's why we're all here to, to help people understand not just what they already believe, but to help people understand ideas that they have no exposure to and that they truly don't get. I mean, we're at a moment right now in this country where people truly don't get each other and some people don't want to and that's fine, but, but we're not here, you know, to, that's not what we are, we are here to do. We're here to help people understand each other. Great. First of all, thank you for coming to Los Angeles. I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, what I love about Michael is that you ask questions and you're not afraid to ask the tough question in a way that's um, not offensive, but you can still elicit an answer that um, I feel honest. Thank you. And it's pretty powerful because you do speak to a range of people that aren't all aligned with how we think and feel. So the question for you is just, can you share any upcoming uh, maybe features or stories that are um, not necessarily like tomorrow's news, but some things that you're working on just to kind of hear what you're thinking about or, or maybe you can't share them because they're kind of in the, in the wraps? Well, so the dirty secret of the daily is that like, it's not like we have planned that far ahead. No. <laughs> the plan is there is no plan. Yeah. Um, we, we call ourselves a crash operation. Um, yeah. we, you know, we are making a show live most days of the week. Yeah. We can get ahead maybe on any given moment, we have two or three shows that, were, that might be like in various stages of doneness. And maybe we plan out a couple of weeks in mm -hmm. advance with our thinking. But the reason I can't answer your question is not because it's proprietary, <laughs> but because there aren't that many like, things well, that far ahead on. Um, I can say that we're, we're thinking about the midterms. And we're thinking about how to cover the midterms in a way that is not necessarily tied to the horse race between two candidates. But the issue, the issue that is central to that um, to that place, and so we have one um, one story from an amazing producer, Lindsay Garrison, which is going to be about um, uh, the midterms in Missouri, and it's it's really focused on the last abortion clinic in Missouri, and the protesters outside and the providers inside, um, and then also uh, in 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 Georgia, the governor race there will be focused on um, on symbols of the Confederacy that the the Democratic governor wants to take down and the Republican governor wants to um, right. lift up. And, and, so, and so it's those kinds of stories that we're excited about for October. Yeah, and I'd say, I'd say we are not by a mile done with Me Too. I think that just there are so many conversations yeah. that have to be had still about it. Right. Um, and I think we have, a couple of, we have a couple of episodes in mind on that. Yeah. So, the clock tells us we are over. Of course. Um, and I can't tell you how grateful I am that you all showed up. I know it's, it's an actual weeknight in a city where traffic is horrible. Um, Thank you. So we couldn't be more grateful. A special shout out to people up there because my gaze has not gone up high enough. <laughs> um, and what I really want to say as we conclude is that um, you all are the original people who took a bet on us. I can just tell from listening to you um, and your knowledge and laughter at the right moments of the bad first episodes. So thank you very much for believing in what we're doing and supporting what we do at the times. Uh, we're, we could not be more grateful. And, and if you have suggestions for what you want to hear on the daily or what we could be doing better, the email to send it to, if you haven't already, is the Caitlin daily. Dickerson. <laughs> Caitlin Dickerson. Caitlin <laughs> Dickerson um, is the daily at nytimes.com. We love, love, love hearing from people. We, we literally celebrate every email we get all day long. We talk about them. We process them. We do not write back to many of them, but we actually receive them, and, and it means the world to us. Um, and finally, see you on Monday. Thank you, guys. <laughs>